All right, I'd like for you to open your Bibles just about to the middle of your Bible to the 22nd Psalm. Uh, this is one of those things you read in the Bible, sometimes you, you, you get moving toward the things you really, really like and you really are familiar with. And, and uh, if you're at Psalm 22, you, you might as well go on to Psalm 23, right? And the Lord is my shepherd, the most probably familiar of all the 150 Psalms. But Psalm 22, it's a great Psalm for uh, Lord's Supper Sunday in July because we're in a series, we're singing our way this summer through the Psalms. These are songs of the faith in the Psalms. And in Psalm 22, the first verse is uh, a verse that should be familiar to you if you're a New Testament reader because it begins this way. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Your translations will say, why have you forsaken me? Now, why is that familiar? I oh, thank you. I'm one person knew. The rest of you were just afraid it was a trick question, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Jesus, it's one of Jesus' seven sayings from the cross. And, and really one of the most questioned and confusing things he said from the cross. The one that's hardest for us to understand. And the reason it's hard for us to understand is because we haven't read the whole 22nd Psalm. It sounds so hopeless and hard and dark when you read the first verse. Jesus says it from the cross and it points to everything else that the psalm says. And what a powerful, prophetic word from God the 22nd is. This opening cry, fulfilled fully. And by the way, a lot of things about prophecy, most things about prophecy, uh, we, like to, we like to make prophecy about, it has nothing to do with the people who heard it in Bible times. It has to do with something way in the future. Prophecy means something to the people who heard it the first time. And sometimes there is a greater meaning, a more complete, fulfilled meaning out there before it. And this is one of those occasions, most certainly. This echoes uh, in the distant past what would become the clear declaration of Christ from the cross. That cry of uh, abandonment, forsakenness. As he hung upon the cross. Mark 15, 34. I'll give you just lots of verse references like that along the way. But there's a whole lot more here. You see, before these words were the words of Jesus from the cross. On a Friday, as he hung on the cross, these were the words of David. King David. And David's own feeling of suffering as he lived in a world broken by sin. And because of that, things Things were hard. Things were difficult. He was confronted regularly by challenge. And it paints this portrait of life in kind of dark gray tones, I think, for us. We see the reality of hurt. We see the, the truth that there is difficulty in this world that we struggle and suffer and have pain and challenges, but we also find hope as we read on through the 22nd Psalm. Hope that transcends whatever we face, whatever obstacles uh, that are yet before us, whatever burdens that we carry, we find hope over pain and loss. The transparency of the 22nd Psalm, uh, as David just expressed, he's, he's, he's not a guy who... Uh, we do this, we do, we do, you know we do this. We put on our, we put on our Sunday go to meeting clothes and we come on to church and we, everything's good. How are you? Good. How are things? Fine. Oh, but the, it's not so good and it's not so fine. David's at least an honest guy in his walk with the Lord. And sometimes he's really excited and everything's good. And sometimes it's hard and everything seems dark and bad, and difficult, challenging. And when it's like that, he expresses that too. He lets other people into his brokenness, into his hurts, into his struggles. And 
He seeks the Lord. He seeks the support of other followers of his God. And we ought to do the same. The Holy Spirit is ultimately pointing in, a, in the words of David to the one who is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, the coming King, Jesus Christ. So here, here we are, for our sakes, the Holy Spirit recorded David's real life experiences in such a way that would perfectly foreshadow what would happen just about a, even thousand years later when Jesus would be suffering on the cross, crucified, dying for our sins. This is, a, this is a real revelation you're about to hear from me. Sometimes life hurts. Sometimes it hurts a lot. And some of you know that story and you feel it today. Sometimes God feels far away. Sometimes you feel forgotten by God, forsaken by God, a little bit of abandoned by God. And even though you know in your head and your heart that is not so, it's still how it feels. And David expresses those kind of feelings. But just know this. Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me from the cross on that Friday? But Jesus, in his perfect knowledge of the word of God, he knew the rest of the psalm too. And we need to get the rest of the psalm locked away in our heart. It's okay to feel what you feel. However, there's another good story that's out there. And it's a story of hope. And it's a story of blessing. And it's a story of fellowship with a God who loves us very much. When we look at Jesus, he, he not only experienced that abandonment, that sense of being forsaken, he truly was forsaken. You know, we know the story that in that statement, the Father Jesus carried the sins of the whole world for all time on his shoulders at the cross. The Father, in his perfection, turned away, the Bible tells us, as the guilt and sin, our guilt, our sin, placed on Christ at the cross. And Jesus took our punishment for us. Jesus endured real abandonment in that time in the perfection of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God in three and one, one and three, the, that miracle of uh, the trini Trinitarian theology of the Bible, that fellowship broken in that moment. Jesus went through that so that we would have the opportunity by grace through faith in Jesus Christ to never be separated from God. To know him completely and fully and always. That's our hope in Jesus Christ. Major takeaway from Psalm 22. So we're going to read the 22nd. And what we want to do is we want to see Jesus throughout. And hear the heart cries of David. And the hope that is ours in the Savior that this psalm points to. As we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Matthew recorded Jesus' words from the cross this way, Matthew 27, 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? It's interesting, you follow Jesus' ministry, Jesus asked lots of great questions. It's a wonderful, I did a sermon series years ago, the questions Jesus asked, he, he asked great questions. This one is one of the most complicated questions he ever laid out there. And so, in so many ways, this question, this question was an illustration of Jesus' whole life and ministry. Because you remember what happened. Jesus says what's quoted here in Psalm 22, or projected, Psalm 22, verse 1. Jesus says this, and you remember how it worked? They said, First of all, they really weren't listening very well, nor did they know over and over again, Jesus said, you know why you're not getting this? You don't, you don't know the word of God. Don't, have you, do you not know it's written? He asked those kind of questions regularly. This is one of those times, because here he is, he says this complex, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what do they do? Eli, Eli, and they go, wait, wait a minute, they're not listening, 
and they don't know the Word of God. And that's what happens to us often in relationship to God. We're really not listening to Him, and we don't know the Word of God. This is why we're, we are moving forward to, to focus heavily, after school starts, a series on the Word of God, opening up the Word of God so that we are leaning into it more and more as a people because it's so key. If you don't know the Word of God, you're just going to miss a lot about what life is about, what God's purpose is for you personally and for this world in which we live. They weren't listening. Eli, Eli, they said, I think he's calling for Elijah. They're off on a tangent, heading the wrong way. Jesus was often misunderstood. And the sad part is he was misunderstood by his enemies. He was misunderstood by his friends. Now at the cross, in that statement of Christ, what looked most as a defeat becomes Jesus' greatest victory. And as Christ spoke to the sin burden that he carried, and he carried it away through his shed blood at the cross, and he overcame through the resurrection and all was most well and all seemed most lost. It sounds hopeless in Matthew unless you have the context of Psalm 22. It's a cry to God declared with hope and of ultimate victory. So Psalm 22 is just filled with images of the cross and we're going to read through and then we're going to reference several of these. The psalmist wrote in a time of despair as he shares this, David says, verse 1, and we'll just read oh, the first five verses here if they're put in your program. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance, from my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you don't answer. By night, yet I have no rest. But, but, oh man, we just took a big turn in the road. Things just changed. The light just came on. He says, but, however, yet, you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted you. They trusted, and you rescued them. They cried to you and were set free. They trusted in you and were not disgraced. Man, that's a whole lot of hope. And I'm glad the road turned because as hopeless as verse 1 is, oh, it's quickly quickly pivots toward a great and glorious, encouraging kind of message. Some of you today walked in and you're living under a dark cloud. Uh, times are hard and you've cried out to God, where are you? Why are these things happening to me? Why do you seem so silent? What are you up to in this? And the answer of God is, he still loves you. He still loves you. He's still on his throne. He still has a plan and he's working it. And you can rest securely in the promises and purposes of God by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Trusted, 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 trust him. It's why God gave his one and only son. It's why Jesus came. Everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that has conquered the world. Our faith. Trust in him. Verse 6. And we're going to read a ways down here. Listen, listen for the cross clues along the way. But I am, a, he's, again, David says, he's talked about how glorious God is, and then he, he sees himself as he is, but I am a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads. He relies on the Lord. Let him save him. Let the Lord rescue him since he takes pleasure in him. It was you who brought me out of the womb, making me secure at my mother's breast. I have given over to you at birth. You have been my God from my mother's room. Don't, don't be far from me because distress is near. There's no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong ones of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me, lions mauling, roaring. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me into the dust of death. You feeling encouraged yet? For dogs have surrounded me, a gang of evildoers have closed in on me. 
Whoa, they pierced my hands and my feet. Huh, ah, that sounds familiar. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves and cast lots from my clothing. Well, how about that? That sounds familiar too, doesn't it? But you, Lord, don't be far away. My strength come quickly to help me. Rescue my life from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of wild oxen. And uh, then that little phrase, you answered me. And I'm so glad you answered me. Let's look at this. We'll start. I'm going to make a pretty good run here. The sufferings of Jesus. Verses 1 and 2. That deep sense of abandonment, loss of relationship. You can compare it to Mark 15, verses 33 and 34. Despised by others in verse 6. Uh, might be good to meditate on another prophet, Isaiah 53, verse 3. Looks of contempt, mocking gestures in verse 7. Mark 15, 27 through 30, give us all those things. Verbal assault and insult in verse 8. You see that fulfilled in Mark 15, 31, 32, Luke 23, 39. Alone and in trouble, verse 11, alone and in trouble. For an example, Matthew 26, 38 through 40. Surrounded by enemies, uh, verses 12 and 13. Well, Matthew 26, uh, 43 through 46 give us some good indications. Crushed spirit, physical exhaustion to the point of death, verses 14 and 15. You meditate on John 19, 28 through 30. Intense pain. Uh, physical abuse, verse 16. John 19, 1 through 3 describes some of that. Uh, Luke 23, 23 does as well. Verse 17, humiliation. Uh, one example, Luke 23, 35. The shame of nakedness, verse 18. Fulfilled in Matthew 27, uh, verse 28, and then on down, verse 35. Need for outside help, verses 19 and 21 of the 22nd Psalm. Mark 14, 35 through 36, uh, Mark 15, 20 through 21. I'm going to touch on those things. So you have, you have all these allu uh, allusions alluding to the story of the cross and what happened to Jesus there. The prophecies fulfilled in such uh, extreme detail. By the way, uh, this is a side note. This is, we're gonna, I talked about focusing on the Bible this fall. We're going to focus on the Old Testament. You know what? Some of these people often ask me, what is the best commentary? If I was just going to get a commentary on the New Testament, what is the best commentary I could buy on the New Testament? The Old Testament. The Old Testament is the best commentary you will ever have on the New Testament. But we're going to focus in on some Old Testament things because this is why we so misunderstand so many things in the New Testament. We don't know the Old Testament. So we're going to get better at that in 2019. Mingle throughout this story of suffering and pain and difficulty and burden. We see some truths about the character of God. God, our source of strength. God, our source of hope. Verse 3, God is holy. God is sovereign. Verse 4, God is trustworthy. Verse 5, God is dependable. Verse, verses 9 through 10, God is near. He's not far off. He is God who is near us. We'll talk more about that in a moment. God is our helper, verses 19 through 21. Now, as the psalm is winding down to its ending, you see more and more glimpses of David's faith in God, his, his belief in the unfailing nature of the God he loves, and also faith for David that one day there is coming a Messiah, one day the promised one of God is going to come to this earth, and God's kingship is declared. Uh, verses 27, 28, 
All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules the nation, and there is coming a day when that will be full and final in declaration declared and lived out, uh, visible to the world. Now, while David continues to seek the tenderness and the love that flow from God's heart, uh, we see, verse 24, God is aware of your suffering. For he has not despised or abhorred the torment of the oppressed. He did not hide his face from him, but listened when he cried to him for help. God uh, also, verse 26, he'll take care of you. The humble will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. That's who our God is. Life hurts, but God heals. And God heals through Jesus, the Son. Because of Jesus' suffering, this is what you can be assured of. You can be assured that whatever you hurt today, whatever the hurts that you came in here caring from the past, whatever your hurts, whatever your grief, whatever your burden, your loss, none of that is outside of God's understanding, His compassion, or His ability to take the most broken parts of us and to redeem them in eternal ways. He takes things that are broken and he makes them whole. He is the redeemer and the reconciler. So, when your heart is broken and your soul is disillusioned, turn your eyes to Jesus because he not only cares about you, he understands what you're feeling and what you're going through. And he is the, uh, old hymn says, the lover of your soul. So here's this psalm and it references, uh, in its references it reminds me, of uh, several things about Jesus as we focus on the Lord's Supper today. It reminds me of his humanity. Jesus is fully God, fully man. 100% of each in the miracle of the incarnation, God becoming flesh. He came to identify with us. He came to live among us. He came to show us, what is God like? How can you really know God? I can read about it here, but when we see Jesus, we see God. This is what God is like. What would God do in this situation? What did Jesus do in that situation? And you start learning. This is who God is. This is what God is like. And this is also how God expects me to live. What God expects for my priorities to be aligned in. So Jesus took on a frail human body. Lived in a sin broken world. Suffered and sacrificed. Died a criminal's death on a cross. And all that for me. And for you. To pay our sin debt that we might be set free from sin. I think about the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel went to visit the exiles, Babylonian exile time. And he went, and the Bible says this, and this is Ezekiel's testimony. He said, I came to the exiles at Tel Abib who were living by the Kebar Canal, and I sat there among them, stunned for seven days. Jesus came and there was a time, he came and he sat among us. He lived on this earth like we live on this earth. He experienced on this earth what we experience in struggle, in pain, in temptation, in relationships. He came to this world and his love was and is personal. And he is not God far off. He is God with us as the prophet said to, uh, the, the angel said to Joseph, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Think of Jesus as Emmanuel, which means God with us. And he is. And he loves you. And if you have never surrendered your life to him in faith and commitment, today is a good day to say yes to Jesus. Today is a good day to begin a relationship to Jesus Christ. And if you have never done that, uh, we're going to have opportunity during the Lord's Supper time and after the service is over. But during the Lord's Supper time, a variety of folks... Uh, our deacons, church staff, who are going to be available to share with you how you can begin a relationship to Jesus so that this reality, no matter where you've been, no matter what you carry, it can all be made new through Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you in that. Now, here's what we're going to do in the Lord's Supper. And, uh, in a moment, I'll invite our deacons up. We're going to do some, some one more thing I want to share with you in our 
spiritual preparation for the Lord's Supper. Uh, and our folks are going to come up to help me out uh, here. There's a, there are trays here, and in a moment our deacons will be coming, and uh, they'll stand next to the tables. They're not there to hand you the things. Uh, so you'll take those things yourself. But here's what they are there for, to pray with you and pray for you. One of those things I said, like David, you shouldn't do life by yourself. You shouldn't just, I'm going to power through. I'm going to soldier on. I'm going to manage all the things I, I, I'm struggling with by myself. Just, it's okay. It's a good thing to say, could you pray for me? Would you pray for me? And this is my struggle. This is my hurt. This is the, the loss that I, I, I just, I'm stuck and I need God's help. Uh, whatever it is, Ask them to pray with you. And they're, they're not going to be catching up on their quiet time. You tell them, this is my, this is what I, my prayer request, and that's what they'll pray about with you. Invite God's people uh, into your life. And uh, they'll, they'll keep confidences and all those things. That's, that's what they do. But our deacon ministry is largely built around a ministry of prayer. And I want to encourage you in sharing your heart uh, clearing some things out. Part of, part of the Lord's Supper is also spiritual preparation. You just have to be ready. Uh, the Bible talks about you need to examine your heart before you take the Lord's Supper. Spend time in confession of sin during this time. And uh, we're not going to come up row by row or anything like that. We want you to spend time in spiritual preparation and, and that's the biggest benefit of this. And The Lord's Supper is something a lot of us have done for a long time. It become a routine thing. Okay, come down. Eat the little cracker, work on getting it out of my teeth for the next hour, drink my little thing of juice. And now I've done the Lord's Supper and it's good, like a good luck charm. That is not what the Lord's Supper is. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. When you do, whenever you do this, as often as you do this, you need to remember me. And that's what we do. Now in a moment, you can, you, when you're prepared, after I've shared this next thing, when you're prepared, come on down, take the Lord's Supper. Let somebody pray with you, pray for you. You can come individually. You can come as a family, as a couple, with friends. And maybe you, sometimes folks just kneel different places in the building, move to the edges of the building, and uh, spend a little time in prayer together with someone else, or just you and the Lord, just getting things squared up. Uh, some, sometimes uh, uh, sometimes uh, in my, my personal prayer time and I've done this in the Lord's Supper times God we all, we all good show me where we're not and uh, let's get let's get this right today and that's that's what the Lord's Supper is for and so that's that's what we're going to be about in just a moment but but first this is something that's in my prayer journal I picked it up a few years ago and uh, I just want to share it with you and it 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 means a lot to me and I just want you to listen. Maybe, you, maybe your eyes open, maybe your eyes closed and head bowed on this. It just tells who Jesus is. And it's a, it's a nice poetic way of doing it. And uh, we're going to talk about Jesus. Here's what it says. Jesus Christ is a wonderful, glorious person. To his people, he is altogether lovely. He is their advocate. He is the angel of the covenant, the author and finisher of faith. He's the alpha and the omega, the beloved, the shepherd and bishop of souls, the bread of life, the bridegroom, the bright and morning star. He's the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of His person. To His people, He's their creator, captain, counselor, covenant, cornerstone, the chiefest among 10,000. To them, He's the dew, the door of the fold, a diadem, a day star, a deliverer, and the desire of all nations, ranks, and generations of his followers. In their eyes, he is the elect Emmanuel, the everlasting Father, the eternal life. He's the fountain of living waters to thirsty souls, 
the joy to troubled ones, the life to dying ones. He's the foundation on which His people with safety build their hopes of heaven. He's the Father of eternity, the first and the last, the first fruits, the firstborn among many brothers, and the first begotten from the dead. To His chosen, He is the most fine gold, guide, governor, a glorious Lord, God, the true God over all, God blessed forever. He's the head of the church, the hope, the help, the husband, the heritage, and the habitation of his people. He's the horn of their salvation and rides upon the heavens. He is the Jehovah of armies, the inheritance, the judge, the king of his people. He's their light. He is their life, their leader, their lawgiver, their atoning lamb, the lily of the valley, and the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the man, Jesus the Christ, the master, the mediator, the minister of the true sanctuary which the Lord has pitched, and not man. He's the mighty God of Isaiah. He's the morning star of John. He's the Michael of Daniel, the Melchizedek of David and Paul, and the Messiah of all the prophets. He's the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's the root and offspring of David. He is the peace and the prince and the priest and the prophet and the purified, the potentate, the propitiation, the physician, the power of God, and the Passover of saints. He's the rock, the refuge, the ruler, the ransom, the refiner, the redeemer, the righteousness, and the resurrection of humble souls. He's the Rosa Sharon. The seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, the son of God, son of man, strength shield, the surety, the shepherd, the Shiloh, the sacrifice, the sanctuary, the salvation, the sanctification, and the son of righteousness to all believers. He's the holy thing that was born of Mary. He is the truth, the treasure, the teacher, the temple. He's the tree of life. He's the way and the well of salvation, the Word of God, the wisdom of God, the faithful witness. He is the wonderful one. His person is one. His natures are two. He's both human and divine, finite and infinite. He was before Abraham, but not born until long after Abraham. He was dead and is alive forevermore. He has the arm of God and the heart of a brother. None loves like him, none pities like him, none saves like him. It is no marvel the children love him, that the saints praise him, the martyrs die for him, the sorrowing long for him, the humble trust in him, and the penitent pour out their hearts before him. The believing lay fast hold of him. His frown shakes the heavens. His smile gives life. His presence converts dungeons into palaces. His blood cleanses from all sin. And his righteousness is the white robe of the redeemed. If you would be safe or wise or happy or holy or useful or strong or victorious, look to him and look to no one else. Walk in Him, abide in Him, glory in Him, count as loss all things beside Him. Look to this day the wonderful, glorious Christ Jesus. It is in His name. Amen and amen and amen.